Okay, thank you. Um, so I just want to start with a small recap uh, from yesterday. I believe I went a bit fast. So in the last lecture, I was trying to tell you some um, properties of, uh, describing properties of um, uh, modular objects like Jacobi forms. And I tried to explain one of the simplest objects, which is this Jacobi form, phi, which has some weight omega and some index m. And then because these objects have these elliptic translation symmetries, you can decompose into a vector value modular form, uh, age muta, which is allomorphic, and a theta function theta. And then I told you that this phi has a Fourier expansion in the following way, in terms of powers of q and y. But the crucial thing, uh, if you want to compute the Fourier coefficient CNL, it only depends on the information stored in these functions, h mu tau. <clears throat> and roughly speaking, these uh, exponents here, uh, they contain information about what I call polarity of CNL. <coughs> Another key aspect is that uh, this h mu tau can have negative powers of q. It usually starts with q to the minus mu squared over 4m, and then you sum up to rich positive powers. Yeah. The equation on the third line. Yeah. This capital A is the same as capital A's. Yeah, this A will be this uh, minus mu squared over 4m. But not this capital A in the second. Here. Yes? Yeah, this is this, this A. This will be this minus mu squared over 4m. So I can write capital A to be equal to something minus R, but R is the summation index of this. R is some, um, yeah, you're summing over here. But it's, it's outside. Sorry? This goes from zero? infinity. Okay. Uh, these polar terms, which have negative powers, play a crucial role because then you can write the, this four coefficients of the vector value model form, but which have the positive powers, you can write in term, exclusively, exclusively in terms of the negative powers, the polar terms here. And this is an exact formula, but is, it's an infinite sum over various terms. Uh, and this term here is called the Klusterman sum and is roughly a complicated uh, sum over phases. <coughs> and this is the multiplier matrix that rotates the data functions under mod modular transformations. And even these multiplier matrices, you can, write them, uh, uh, you can write them in terms of similar sums as this, as 2 pi i and ratios, uh, uh, ratios uh, uh, rational numbers. And the final term uh, of this expression is this special function, okay, which contains information about the polar coefficients and uh, this invariant, this, this combination here that, you, that corresponds to the, the, the state you, you want to compute, the, the degeneracy. Okay. <clears throat> and then I explained that for fixed M and large, uh, and large uh, argument, n minus mu squared for m, <coughs> the uh, degeneracy is well approximated by uh, these Bessel functions, by, by a Bessel function. But the analysis I've done uh, yesterday was uh, pretty general. <coughs> but once you uh, um, specify for, for uh, particular examples of black holes in n equals 8 compactifications, like T2 times T4, the Jacobi form is actually pretty simple. It has weight minus two, index one, and then you follow all this mechanism and you find this answer with this number here, nine over two. For T2 times K3, uh, this object is not exactly a Jacobi form. It's called a metamorphic Jacobi form, but I'm not gonna enter into those details into no mock modular theory. But the crucial thing is that while here there's only one polar term, in this theory, you have arbitrary polar terms depending on the index. Index is not, goes from one to infinity. And the object you obtain after a big machinery is still a Bessel function, which is this form. It has this number here, 25 over two. And it has this coefficient multiplying that Bessel function. <coughs> you can do repeat the same thing, but now for general Calabiao, n equals two, SU3 Calabiao. Now the object is even more complicated because it has not only one index, but it has an array of indices. 
So it's a more complicated theta function. <clears throat> and there are very chemical potentials here. But uh, once you work out everything, you still find a Bessel type behavior for efficiency, the same form. And then you can read various, various things like uh, CAPC is a triple intersection matrix of the Calabiao. C2 is the second churn class of the Calabiao. B2 is the dimension of the H11, the second cohomology class. And DAB is just this contraction, okay? Just properties of, uh, general properties of the Calabiao. But it's still a special function that, and has this, this factor. So the conclusion here is that I didn't even tell you what were the dynamics of the CFTs but they all share the same property in this limit <coughs> that they are described by, uh, the addition is described by a Bessel function. <coughs> and the hope will be that uh, black holes which are dual to these states um, will have entropy which um, grows as the subtle point of this expression, this exponential. Okay. So I think uh, Samir will, will describe this computation of this function here. So I hope you can write it on your note notebook. Okay. okay, that's it. So that was what was missing in my lecture yesterday. And uh, today I'm gonna talk about churn simons theory, roughly like uh, a bit mathematics topology. Yes, sorry? There's only classical intersection numbers. So everything is yeah. Just yeah, it's not quantum periods or whatever, no. Just a geometry, uh, yeah. You're smiling? <laughs> okay. What's, what's bothering you? How do you know this is true? Huh? How do you know this is true? What are you going to do? How do I know? <laughs> it's not just me, it's the literature. Yes, no, no, <laughs> There's no literature about it. No, this just follows from other deformations and anomalies of the theory, okay? There are many currents which are anomalous, and the, and the, the levels are these numbers, and then you can deduce all these, all these numbers from there. And there is no explicit derivation of any of these files, right? Which, which files? Oh, oh, explicit is more complicated because of all crossing all these phenomena, yeah. Yeah, there are many things which are known. You don't know, for example, the spectrum of polar states, but you know, like the the leading polar term has this coefficient, and it's very so important. The modular properties are determined entirely by the yeah. yeah, and this factor here is the polar the efficiency of the polar term, the first one, which is the maximal polarity. Basically, the dynamics of the theory. Okay, maybe uh, yeah. Just one last question about this. Very naive. So where do these formats come from? You have a two-dimension CFT on a torus, and you compute some elliptic genes, yeah. that's it. But you don't have to know the full, pro full dynamics of the theory, that's my point. Okay. You just need some properties like anomalies of the currents that will determine the levels of the, the modular, modular form, forms, whatever. Okay, okay so part two uh, will be uh, try to describe some um, just Chen Simon's theory. Okay. So basically, uh, one considers a path integral with uh, with some action, which is the Chen Simon's action in three dimensions. So one has a compact uh, three-dimensional manifold. Okay. Okay, today it will be a bit um, general, but I will describe the foundations for tomorrow to do some explicit computation. So then you'll learn the fundamental tools of Schoen Simon's theory. And this A is some Lie algebra gauge field, okay, some TA, some Lie algebra of some gauge group G. And also know that um, A transforms under gauge transformations. OK. 
Okay, so G is some element of the gauge group. Then I think many of the things you have learned from Diego's talk, but I don't know how much detail uh, because I, I, did, I missed the first lecture. Then also know that field strength F D A A which A field strength is not gauge invariant, but it transforms covariantly. So F goes to G F G minus one. Um, another cute thing is that this k here, which you see is the coupling constant, is actually quantized. I won't explain the full details of quantization, but I just give you a, uh, some clues. So if you know how it works direct quantization, you have, for example, compute some Wilson line, A. So the H is some abelian gauge field, for example. Then you can, this is like in 3D space, you can just close this uh, um, line here with the surface here on this side, right? Or you could also do it, um, you have the same, okay, it's not good. You have the same thing, but you could just close it on the other side Okay, it's just a choice. <clears throat> so the two things must be the same. So you have here some S plus, some S minus, and you know that this thing is equal to the integral of F, okay? Just a, a Stokes theorem. And then what you have is something like F on S plus equals to F on S minus, was it just a choice? When you put this back on the other side, you have something minus f. But the two servers have different orientation. So this thing here is f uh, s plus or s minus. So it's full is like completing this is like a, a now compact uh, manifold. And there should be some 2 pi i here. <coughs> So this means that this object here should be equal to one, okay? And now this thing here, um, <clears throat> uh, sorry, this should, uh, so this F uh, has some quantization condition. I should put, sorry, I forgot here the charge. Some charge here. So this Q times this, this quantization gives another quantization condition. That's the direct quantization condition. Now this said, you could do the same thing, but instead of A, you have computed this integral. Trace A wedge D A plus two thirds A Q of M. Now what you have to find out is a four dimensional manifold. You find an M4, which has this M at the boundary and repeat the same thing, okay? And instead of using this F to be quantized, you have to use the fact that <clears throat> D of the, uh, um, the Chern-Simons Lagrangian, and I'll leave it as an exercise because it's really nice. <clears throat> uh, this thing is just, um, uh, trace of F wedge F. And then this thing is quantized depending on the gauge group, the gauge group in a particular way. That's how you find the quantization of K. Okay. Then you can compute, so because there's no metric in this theory, there's only connections. There are only two observables you can compute, two types of observables. One is the partition function, obviously. And the other one is the Wilson loop that was already uh, introduced. So the Wilson loop, I'll just review, call WR. I'll just explain this. <clears throat> so you have to choose uh, a particular uh, 
uh, link or not link like uh, contour, a particular cycle. Then you take a trace. <clears throat> So you have like your M and then you're integrated along this C, okay? But while this A here is the fundamental of the, of the representation, uh, you, here A will be in the representation R. In the different, you can put a different representation. And this P denotes uh, the path ordering of the exponential. Why is that? It's because this A is not a billion. So if you don't do this integration uh, correctly, this object won't be gauge invariant. So there's a particular way you have to do this integration. Uh, let me just tell you. Uh, <clears throat> so for example, if you have some Contour like this. So basically, you have to divide it in small steps. I just give, and, if it, and then you have to take the limit when the steps are very, very small, infinitesimal. Like at t0, then at t1, and so on. <clears throat> and you call the allonomy. So if you forget the, the trace for the moment, this object here, <coughs> it's called uh, allonomy. And it's basically some limit. So I'll put just n to infinity. So basically, you divide this in n, n steps, and then take to infinity. And basically, let's compute this um, t0, tn. <coughs> this, <coughs> but uh, this, exp this product is ordered. So it goes from. Uh, T0, so basically have a mu, sorry, this is a Ti this is a, a T0, and then you do this a mu T1, delta x mu, and so on, from left to right or right to left, depending on the conversion. And then the point is that these A's are not a billion, so you have to be careful these this things of exponentiating the operators which are not commuting and so on. So I'll leave it to exercise. It's a very good exercise to understand this. So I have the solution I can show you. So you can show that under the gauge transformation, dg, g minus one, if you keep this order, what will happen is that this allonomy thing operator will transform uh, covariantly. That is, this one. So when you close, you get G allonomy, G minus one. So when you take a trace, it's gauge invariant. So it's a really nice exercise because you have to do this very carefully. <clears throat> so here I described the, so this is the wish loop. But you can complicate things, actually. You can, uh, so if you can have this, but you can have things like uh, going, um, you can have loops like this. So these are links, they are length. Okay, you can have things like this. Then you can have knots also. So let me try to draw. Knots. Uh, this. It's like a, it's called a trefoil knot. <clears throat> and then you can put your uh, integrals of the gauge connections along these paths. And then you'll be computing things like uh, expectation value. So suppose you have 
uh, R of these paths, of these Wilson lines. So these are CIs for each CI. Take the product and I can put the expression value of this. Take the churn sign transaction and then I just put the usual uh, whistle loop operators. Now, if all, so you could put uh, each whistle loop in different representations, but if you put all of them, so if RIs, all the RIs, all RIs are in a dimensional presentation of SUN, then this object will be equal to what is called a Jones polynomial. So this is a Witten famous paper, what he got the field medal. And this polynomial counts uh, Nazi invariants. So you see, so there's so many invariants here that you know the links cannot just cross its, its, uh, themselves. And there's some counting things you can you can compute. So you get some some polynomial function, and the coefficients count some sort of topological invariant that distinguishes different knots. So you see the theory is heavily interacting because of the A cube. It's a non-abelian gauge theory. So to compute this thing is very complicated. But there is a perturbative analysis, which I'm going to try to describe first. Perturbative analysis. So what is perturbative analysis? Is basically you take k to infinity. I mean. Well, it's k much bigger than one. <clears throat> so this corresponds to a perturbative. So if you have k, you have this a wedge d a plus this two thirds a cube, right? So what do you do usually in quantum field theory? You rescale a by a over square root of k. Then this becomes canonically normalized, and then you get one over square root of k the AQ two thirds, and this is your interaction, to your interaction term. But uh, since we are computing, I, want just, I will be interested in computing, for example, the partition function for the moments. So we have this. All right. Q. So roughly when you take K very large, You'll have a sum first thing. You'll have a sum over the subtle points of your of your uh, Lagrangian, and the subtle points. So the equations of motion. I also leave as an exercise. The equations of motion are the flat connections. So this is by definition f, and it has to be zero. So what you do in physics is is that you you find the subtle points. So one will have what? So one will have i k for pi. I will call this the churn simons action of A. Okay. Churn simons of flat flat connection. And then you have to sum over all your saddles, flat connection. And then you have to introduce uh, quantum corrections. Okay. That will be like, uh, uh, so this is the coupling constant, uh, 1 over k. So there will be uh, square root of k to the power 0 will be a constant, uh, <clears throat> k to the 1, and so on. Okay. That's the perturbative uh, computation.
one important thing before going into describing a little bit how to compute, for example, the, uh, the first loop, uh, first loop correction. Um, a flat connection is particularly special because uh, suppose I, I'm, we try to compute some uh, like a, this path order exponential here along a square like this. I also leave it as an exercise. And this square is pretty small, OK? It's just like infinitesimal, just an example. And this thing you can show is basically the exponential of f, where f is really the non-abelian kitschu integrated over this circuit here. Now you see that if a is flat, then this is just 0. So if you have computing um, a whistle loop along this cycle C, if I, <clears throat> if I deform it smoothly, it's called like a, an, an omot a mon a omotopy, so something like this, C prime, then if the connection is flat, then basically these, you know, these integrals here, you could imagine like small cells like this, you know, like that, and so on. So those little cells will give zero, OK? So it means that uh, this operator here, the allonomy operator, is invariant under this homotopy transformation. So this is really cool because this operator then just knows about the uh, multiple pro properties of your manifold. In particular, so this is, sorry, this is for a flat connection. Uh, this allonomy thing, this allonomy of A flat, the allonomy is a map from any circle that is non-contractible, which is this pi 1 group of the manifold into the gauge group. Okay. So basically, if your manifold has a pi 1 which is trivial, then all these anonymies of that connection must be trivial. G, sorry, with up, up to conjugation. Accelerate. Sorry. So you, you get you get some. Uh, so basically, what I'm saying is that if you get some something like you get the matrix in G G minus one, this is the same as the same matrix. Okay. That's identification. Okay, I have to uh, accelerate a bit. Okay, this is like basics. <clears throat> This will be important because sometimes you have uh, a gauge field which is not a billion, but it's flat. And so the trick is to go to a particular, in the form of the cycle such that the gauge field becomes like commuting, all the components commuting, and then it's easy to compute the whistle loop. That's why this is important. So then you sit in, into the cartel of G? Or? Yeah, there's some, inside they can, the components will change, right? It's flat, so they become highly non abelian the components. But there's a point you can deform the, the, the cycle C such that the, the, all the components commute to themselves. And then the path order exponential is very easy. It's just exponential of the whistle line. Um, so I will not compute the determinant, but so you, you pick this, this flat connections and look at the fluctuations of that and compute some determinants. So you have this ik for pi churn simons flat. And then you compute some determinant, one loop of that, which depends on the flat connection, plus corrections, OK? Now, the crucial observation by Witten is that uh, in churn simons the theory does not depend on any metric, obviously, classically. But quantum mechanically, you have to choose a metric to impose a gauge condition. So gauge condition is always a scalar. 
So in order to have a scalar, you really need to put, to put a metric. There's no other option. And so you have to make a choice of metric. So how do you know this thing does not depend on the metric after all? Because the theory is topological. Otherwise, you have some sort of anomaly. And it's funny that this determinant, one loop, uh, depends on something which is topological. And so independent of the metric that you have chosen to make uh, the gauge fixing condition. So this thing is called the uh, Heidmeister Ray Singer torsion. And there's another thing which is usually is forgotten, which is very important, is that in the one-loop fluctuations, you can have uh, zero modes. And if you have zero modes, it will actually depend on k. So there will be a dependence on the level, which goes like dimension of a I will not explain how you get this, but um, so exercise is that if you have this thing, you have a flat connection which obeys this, then there's some operator D, which is D plus AF, and you can check that D square equals zero. So each flat connection defines a sort of uh, cohomology, and then you compute the dimension of this cohomology. For example, Suppose you have just uh, Maxwell fields, kinetic terms on a compact manifold. The zero modes are just the, the one forms. That's the analog of this dimension of H1. And then this H0 actually H0 comes from because you are gauge fixing. There are some constant uh, uh, ghost, ghost fields that can contribute to that um, thing. Uh, I, I leave this thing because this K uh, you can actually show that it appears in these special functions. Uh, just, just the comment I want to leave. So is, it, is it clear that the theory is topological and by contradiction or not clear? Yeah, it is. Yeah. It's people have shown mathematically. Yeah, people have shown uh, that. But in principle, all the uh, loop corrections, like all the coefficients of the expansion, the level, will be topological invariance by definition. OK, so I have like half an hour. These are the basics. So this is the, the perturbative thing, and it could, could continue. People have computed this, all these corrections. Not for all manifolds, but for, for some of them. You can actually compute, you can compute this using localization, the path integral, and then check uh, this k expansion. What I'll try to describe now is how to compute this, this uh, non-perturbatively. So that's what Witten uh, became famous for, more or less. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so there's an important, uh, okay, you may be wondering why I'm going with all these mathematical definitions, but the thing is that many of these things uh, you can generalize to that black hole context. Not all of them, but many features will appear and I'll try to explain them tomorrow. But the, the, Witten's point is that there's a theorem of mathematics that say that, that any three manifold compact can basically be obtained by some operation on S1 times S2. There's some operation, you take, you're going to get that manifold. There's some operation. And that operation is called uh, surgery. So basically, you pick S to S1, you make some cuts, you do some transformation, and glue it back, and you get the M. And this is not non-trivial. It means that you can generate any arbitrary three-dimensional manifold, compact. So what is uh, surgery? You know what is surgery, but <laughs> what does it mean in this context? So the idea is that you have your so it also means that you can also start with M and do surgery, okay? And you get any other manifold. So you have your M, 
and then you pick some uh, path, okay, some line. There's no, there's no whistle loop, it's just a geometric construction. You just do that. <coughs> and then what you do is that you thicken this line, which is uh, one dimension, you thicken this line to imagine, give him like something, right, around. And then this becomes uh, like a tube that goes around this line. So there's some QI. Uh, is this understandable? OK. You thicken that. It's like a tube. So you can write M. You can write M as M star. I'll just uh, describe what is M star. And this is like a glued, means glued. It's tube of C. Sorry, this is, uh, there's a contour C here. And I call this tube, tube of C. Okay. And this M star is obviously M without the tube. Okay. You have this thing, you remove the tube, get M star and the tube, okay? That's obviously. So this M star, so this M star is now a 3D manifold but with, with a boundary. And the boundary of that is a torus of this tube, obviously, okay? So delta. It's just the boundary of this tube, see, which is like T2. It's right. so obviously. So how, what is the surgery? Is that uh, this tube, which is a solid torus. Now what you can do, pick the tube, you cut it, okay? Make a cylinder, you twist it, with some angle and glue it back. They got another tube. And then there's, a, there's, a, there's like a, a hole in this M star and you put that tube back. That's the surgery. So the new manifold So the new manifold we call M tilde is what? It's M star again. And you glue back some twisted version of this tube, tube tilde. <clears throat> so what is this twisted version? What does it mean? Let's take for example, let's take for example this tube. <coughs> So how, how does it work in more detail? You pick this tube. This tube you can always decompose as a disk, D times S1. So this is a circle, okay? It's a disk, obviously. Okay, you can always decompose that. Now the boundary of this tube is what? Is the boundary is S tilde one times S1. And this is just the boundary of this disk, obviously. So uh, S tilde one, the circle, because it bounds a disk, it becomes contractible in the full geometry. So this parameterizes the contractible cycle. And the S1, the non-contractible. Somehow I define different notation. So now 
uh, just define uh, C1 to be S1, C2 to be S tilde 1. Um, <clears throat> so how odd is this twist? So you, you take the tube, you cut it, twist, glue it back, and put it inside the manifold. So how does it work? Uh, this, this twist, this cutting and twist, is basically a, ch a different change of um, uh, basis for the cycles. So you have this tube, which has cycles at the boundary. And then um, and then it shows a different linear combination of C tilde 1 and C tilde 2. Okay, It's a different linear combination. And what you do is that you attach, you attach, attach uh, disk to C tilde 2. And uh, keep C tilde 1 uh, non-contractible. Okay, that's how, how it works. It's different basis, you attach a disk to that, that, that cycle. Now, the combination, for example, the combination A C1 plus B C2 is the non-contractible cycle. And the combination C C1 plus D C2 is the contractible. Uh, pictorially, how does this work? For example, now I need colors. So I have, I have my tube, I cut it. So I can say this is like cycle C2, for example, and C1 goes like this. Okay. So if I identify this side, of the cylinder with itself, <coughs> what do I get? I get, uh, you know, the solid torus, this, uh, where you have here a disc. But now, as you can see, this is contractible, right? <coughs> so this thing here is cycle C2. And the cycle that goes around the hole is a C1. As you can see. But I could do it in a different way. So instead of uh, putting identifying this way, I have the C2 uh, like this. So basically, you still have the same cycles, okay? C2, C1, okay? But first, I put this, the disk here. And, and identify this side with that side. So what do I get? It's again a solid torus. But now the contractile cycle is C1, right? Yeah. And the other one, which is around the hole, is a C2. Okay. With, this, with a, uh, an important thing, there's a choice of orientation you have to do here. <laughs> and how does this work? So basically, So 
there's some orientation thing. Uh, that means what? Um, the thing is that you have to rotate this in a different way. So you want, you want this, this picture is not very well because I want to keep the disk like this and this line like this. Okay, so basically I will rotate this. Okay, just rotate. And then you have uh, the same picture. C1. But now the C2 will run, the C2 will run this way. That side. And then identify this part with this part. And so what happens from this picture to this one, you can see very easily that the C1, so I'll, I'll put A and B. So the C1 in A will go to minus C2 because it goes in the other way. Minus C2 and B. And the C1, or the, we'll go to the C2. Okay? The, 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 sorry, the C2 here will go to the C1 here. Now this, you can easily see that the C1 and C2 went to minus 1, 1, 0, C1, C2, okay? And it is S element of S to Z, S element of SL to Z. Uh, <clears throat> So it's important the orientation so you get S to Z. So, so this idea of uh, filling the torus with choosing a different cycle on the boundary is called a then filling, then filling procedure. So uh, I'll put here, so procedure of filling the solid torus. Then um, I think I can erase this. Me, okay, I should speed up. Uh, I live in uh, a, a nice exercise. For example, surgery, for example, take S1 times S2. What is this geometrically? You have a sphere, okay, times S1. Now, you cut the sphere in half. This runs like this, and then you have a circle here and a circle here. Of course, an hemisphere is the same as a disk, homeomorphically, okay? So now this does a disk. So you have, again, you have a solid torus here, another solid torus here. The fact of gluing this way corresponds just to the, the identity, this SL to Z map. So you, you do a surgery with the uh, identity and becomes S1 times S2. Now suppose you do surgery with this element here, the S element of Z. What do you think is going to happen? So basically, I identify this circle here with this one and this uh, cycle here with S1. So the full geometry doesn't have any more any non-contractible cycle. So if you do surgery, with S, then you obtain a three sphere, topologically. Uh, and in general, 
in general for arbitrary uh, A, B, C, D, starting from S1 times S2, he got what is called length space. So this M tilde is just to be the, the um, land space, which you usually denote as L of C and D. Just depends on these this two integers. Um, how much time do I have? 15 minutes? Started much. It's okay. Let's make it 15. Uh, okay, so then this is very simple surgery on this manifold. But, and you just consider a particular uh, uh, cycle there. But you could have put like the joint cycles. You could have considered starting from, so you're starting from, uh, start from, let's put S3 because it's easier to uh, draw. Starting from S3, then you can just pick the usual, uh, this uh, uh, cycle C, and you can do surgery on, on here, and then you get the land space. But I could put, uh, could do surgery on, a, on disconnected cycles, or I could do surgery on more complicated stuff, on link, and then you can generate any manifold you have. That's how, how it works. Or I could do like the knots. If it is a knot, you can do the surgery on the knot, and then you generate all the manifolds, any. Uh, Um, so what is the idea of Witten? So how did Witten compute the, the partition function non-perturbatively? <coughs> so he wants to compute Z. And so what, what he did is that, well, if I can do this, arbitrary on M tilde, what I will do is that I'll just take uh, um, the case of one. Suppose um, M but I'm going to compute partition function on M, some arbitrary manifold. I want to compute this. <clears throat> and I know that M is equal to some surgery on S3. Okay. So what it does is that it starts from S3, <clears throat> from S3. Then you put your path, and then you put a, a whistle loop here on the path. Some representation ri. And what he's saying is that z on S3 with this uh, whistle loop ri, <coughs> after surgery, uh, sorry. So the Z of M is equal to Z on S3 with WRI. C. <clears throat> and then there is some matrix here, I and zero, which depends on this SL to Z matrix. Roughly speaking, this, you are doing surgery here on this manifold with a, with a loop. And then you end up with M without any whistle loop, with no Wilson loop. <clears throat> then he claims that the partition functions are related in the following way, where Ki, it's 
is like a, okay, so homomorphism is like a representation of a cell to Z on some Hilbert space, which I'm not going to describe. But the important thing is this K. So there's some matrix K there, <coughs> IJ, which basically takes um, some element of gamma, a cell to Z, right, and maps it to this uh, some Hilbert space, Hilbert space, which is finite dimensional uh, space. It was like a representation. And this K is very nice, so it's very smart, which means that if you know K, this matrix K for S and T, which is the two generators, okay, if you know this matrix, because that is a representation, it's like an homomorphism, then K of S, T, some N, S, T, M, and so on is just a product So this K then becomes just a product of S, K, T, N, K, S, K, T, M, and so on so we just need to know the images of the generators, and then you can build the full partition function. And this uh, is really uh, reminiscent of what I talked yesterday about these multiplier matrices. Because it's some group action. So these M's, um, <coughs> very briefly, but roughly these M's are sort of these K's. So once you know the generators, you can build uh, matrices for the full, for the general, I still to Z. Okay, so I have five minutes, and I'll finish with um, a very important step, actually. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> so the last thing I wanted to uh, talk about, and is important, is the, how to compute, how to compute uh, the churn Simons action. For a flat connection. So I want to compute this integral. Q when D A plus A wedge A equals zero. And I want to compute it uh, on the solid torus. Because that will be the building element, building block of all this business of surgery. <clears throat> and I'll just consider SU2. But you can generalize. So if A is flat, that means you can always write it this way, dg, g minus 1, OK, the gauge group. You can check it's up as this equation. You can always write this way. Then there's a nice thing is that you can always choose a particular coordinates and um, uh, element of the gauge group such that uh, <coughs> you can always write uh, g. So OK, before that, sorry. So the disk times S1, so we have a disk here. This is the radial direction. And this is like the angular coordinate x. And you have S1, which is parameterized by the coordinate y, OK? So I was saying that you can always write this case transformation, which depends on x, r, and y, in the following way. You can always separate it into an f, x of r minus y. So it's very cool. So this function, it's non-abelian. 
it, it lives in the gauge group, but only lives on the disk. So you, you can do separation of variables. And this Y is on the circle. And <clears throat> And you also have the condition that, um, so this f goes from d to the gauge group. And you also have the condition that limits when r goes to 1. So this is, uh, I'll put in here the boundary at, uh, boundary at r equals 1. Limit of this f x r, it goes like minus i alpha over 2, 3 x. So which means that the gauge, uh, um, the gauge transformation, the boundary, it just uh, uh, on the carton, on the sigma 3. So this g limit r goes to 1, something like minus i of 2. Y. And that means that the flat connection as R approach the boundary becomes what I call this abelian connection. Okay. Just becomes abelian. All the components are abelian, are commuting. <clears throat> and remember what I said now, uh, because the flat connection, I can compute the allonomy uh, wherever I want. Okay. So, so oh, it's from zero to one. It can choose it's from zero to one or, huh? Yeah, it can go to infinity. It's at the boundary. No, Doesn't matter. It yeah, it can go to one or it can go to a billion if you want. The important is the boundary condition. This. It's the boundary condition. So, because I said you can compute the allonomy at r equals 1. And now it's easy. The, connect, the components are all commuting. And this is just the exponential of the whistle line. So the path order then becomes just the exponential of a okay, on that path. So if you do it along this s1, then this becomes i pi beta minus I pi beta. Okay, I'll just check the final computation, then I think you have to do it uh, by yourself. So basically, you compute this minus dg, g minus 1. So you'll get minus delta f, delta r, f minus 1 dr, minus delta f, delta x. Psi, f, beta, it's 1 dy, OK? And then you have to plug it. So this trace of a wedge dA plus 2 thirds a cube becomes minus one third trace a wedge a wedge a using the condition that d a equals minus a wedge a here and then you plug this a inside this thing <clears throat> and what you'll find is that um, this is I leave it as an exercise two pi beta d omega integral on the disk where omega is trace of the f i two plus one. And then Stokes theorem, you can put this on the circle and what you'll find is the most important result. Here. So 
So what you'll find is that strength summons action with a slight connection on this times S1 is equal to pi beta 12 of omega on circle, which is the boundary of the disk, 2 pi square beta times alpha. Okay, so you can try to do it. It's not so difficult. Okay, I'll finish here. Thank you.